Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. God put it on my heart to um, go back to uh, 1 John chapter 3, turn to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. I came across a video from a brother in Christ, again, it's an old video about the Antichrist challenge. Did this man fail the Antichrist challenge because he verbally said, has come in the flesh versus is come in the flesh? But I want to go through this again because God put it on my heart when it comes to judgment today. How are we supposed to judge, period? For instruction and righteousness and what's really going on in John chapter uh, 4, 1 John chapter 4. So let's read this real quick. The very first verse says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. That's key. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone, are gone out into the world. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there's two parts to this very first verse. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Try and spirits. That's the first part. Second part is, is because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we put, I put this up here because man, remember in Genesis, well, the Bible talks about how God made man from the dust of the ground, body, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, spirit, and man became a living soul. Okay? So we have a body, we have a soul, and we've got a spirit. Uh, we're going to hit the body real quick. Romans 7.18. Turn to Romans 7.18. Romans 7.18 says... For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Now the Bible talks about time and time again, that the dwelleth in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They've all become unprofitable. They've, together, they've all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay? We still have this body of flesh, even as a saved sinner. Lost people, the soul is connected to the body. Saved people, the soul, if there was a line here, it gets erased, spiritual circumcision, and that soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. We have a perfect body. So when the Bible's talking about sinless, they, they try to abuse that and say sinless perfection. You can be sinless in this life. Oh, no, no, no. This body and this life cannot be sinless. But the body that your soul is now connected to when you're saved, Jesus Christ, he is sinless. He is perfect. But this body here, not perfect. What did we just read there? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the body? No. What about this one? Turn to Genesis 8. Turn to Genesis 8. Your body can get in the way and make mistakes. Are we supposed to judge on the outward appearance? Or are we supposed to judge righteous judgment? Genesis chapter 8. Verse 20 and 21. And Noah built an ark, built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet Savior, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imaginations of his heart is evil. Man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Man's heart is evil continually. That heart, that's, not the heart, that's not the soul. Yes, it is. It's the soul. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How do you put the flesh down as a saved sinner? You hide God's perfect written word, the King James Bible, in your heart, and you obey it, and you live it, and you bring your body into subjection. That's why the Bible says, to, uh, present your body a living sacrifice. You're sacrificing it. You're putting it down. Okay? But once again, the lost state, the body's in charge. The soul loves what the body's doing. Evil imaginations. The body is wickedness. Okay. But once again, what did we just read there? Did it say try the soul? No, it didn't. 
What did it say to do? It said try the spirits, whether they are of God. And notice it says spirits, plural. We're going to get to that. Job 32.8. Turn to Job 32.8. It says, but there is a spirit in man. There's a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. Okay, we're supposed to try the spirits. Now one thing when we get down to here, here's the four spirits we're going to be talking about here shortly. But here, remember, the spirit of man. Okay, man's wisdom tries to get in the way. But God put, what is it, the, the laws of God are written on every man's heart, the soul. And the spirit of man, remember what the Bible says, that the, uh, the Jews seek after a sign, that the Gentiles seek after wisdom. Sometimes man's wisdom can get in the way. They're trying to understand something that they can't understand without the Holy Spirit. There's sometimes you could have the Holy Spirit, this is the Spirit of man, but you can have the Holy Spirit of God, which we're going to get to over here. And God's like, I'm not ready to reveal that to you. And if you try to jump the gun and say, well, I'm going to try to figure it out myself without waiting on the Lord, you can make a mess of things. Okay? But this Spirit, what did we just read there? Go back to 1 John Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. And this is where it gets confusing for some people. Someone can say something, or someone can do something, and they get judged on the spot. Brother says, Christ, this isn't fast food Christianity. You want fast food Christianity? There's a lot of false religions out there you can go be part of. And I don't want you to go be part of it. But I'm saying, I'm getting frustrated because the brethren are... We have this falling away. We have this, these brethren that are turning their back on the Word of God when it comes to how you treat brethren, how you look at things, loving the world, as far as loving the lost world, the people in it, by preaching truth to them, the plan of salvation, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, loving God's Word and everything. They want everything fast food. They want it to be easy and everything. It's like, well, I'll judge on this because we can see this and I'm not going to obey the scriptures when it says, try this. It takes some investigation. It takes actually getting to know the person and talking to the person to see where this is. Where this is. Because all we can see is this. The body. I don't know if you can see it, but the body. That's all we can see. And God tells us, hey, you can be deceived by this. The body. Now, I just was reading, it talks about the sepulchers. Uh, the uh, Sadducees, scribes, and Pharisees. The Pharisees and scribes, that on the outward, they look like white sepulchers, but inwards they're full of dead man's bones. We see someone, you can come across somebody, brother and sister Christ, that on the outside they make a mistake. They can look ratty on the outside. Does that mean that they're a lost, hell-bound sinner? No. But let's flip it around. You come across people that wear nice suits and ties. On the outside, they look good. Nice suit and tie, nice comb hair. You know who wears nice suit and ties? Lawyers. Bankers. Organized religion has outfits where they look nice and everything. Okay? And I hate to say this, but harlots dress nice on the outside. They dress immodestly on the outside, but it's nice. Okay? But brother says, Christ, if this is all you're going to go on, you're going to be deceived all the time. 90% of the time, you'll be deceived. Why? And God knows this. That's why God said, judge not on the outward appearance, but judge the righteous judgment. That's why he said, try the spirits. Not the body, not the soul, but the spirits. Try the spirits. Okay, let's keep reading real quick. Verse 2, 1 John 3 1 John 4, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. 
Now, I, I remember what, I did a study on this back when because people say, oh, he's changing. I never, ch I never did the Antichrist challenge. I was trying to point out that when you confess, the Bible says confession comes from the heart. Or it can be manipulated by this over here, the spirit. With man, uh, with the heart, I'm sorry, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth, body, soul, or spirit can talk, with, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Your soul can talk, your body can talk, and your spirit can talk. But here's where salvation starts. I mean, the plan of salvation, this is what God looks at. He doesn't look at this, the outward appearance. He looks at this, the soul. He sees what kind of spirit's behind it. Is it a humble spirit? Or is it a prideful spirit? Is it a deceiving spirit? He looks at the heart. Okay, it says confess. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, notice it says spirit. And it says, Here, hereby we know the spirit of God, which we're going to get to here in a second. Spirit of God. I'm getting used to having a board. <clears throat> and it says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Every spirit or every body. No, it says spirit. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. And we're going to get to this at the very end. What's the whole purpose of this chapter? It's to protect, I'll get ahead of myself. It's to protect people and get people, brethren, to make sure that, hey, you're staying in the course. You're walking and fighting the good fight. You're staying the course. You've got your eyes on Jesus Christ for the catching away of the, of, the, of the body of Christ. And you've got people that are starting to act like Antichrist spirit people. And they're trying to push you to, uh, you've got to endure to the end to be caught up. They're trying to get you to act like post and mid-trib. They're getting you to act like you're going to go through that time of Jacob's trouble. And the whole point of this Antichrist spirit, I'm getting way ahead of myself, is to prepare this world for the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm pointing at my notes over here. Time of Jacob's trouble. To get him ready for it. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Remember it says spirits, plural. Right here. There's, I, 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 I learned a teaching from a brother in Christ. We'll start from this side. You have four basic spirits in the Bible. You've got God is a spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and then it breaks the Holy Spirit down where it says the seven spirits of God. We'll read them. We'll get through them. And talks about the different things that the Spirit's responsible for, the Holy Spirit. Then we just read one verse about the Spirit of man. Man has a spirit. you got to discern. With the Holy Spirit and God's perfect written word, He gives us discernment that we can tell the difference between the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of man getting in the way, the Spirit of the beast, Okay, animals have a spirit. And then we have, I put, I put evil spirits and Satan over here. Evil spirits and Satan. There's all kinds of evil spirits. But the main spirit here is satanic, the satanic spirit that's uh, the antichrist spirit. It's what's being tested here. But there's all kinds of evil spirits. Okay. So let's start over here. Okay. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. <clears throat> Singular. God is a spirit, singular. Uh, John 4, 24. Oops. Went a little too far. John 4, 24. It says, God is a spirit, singular, but it's a capital S spirit. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not saying, I'm sorry, they're Trinitarian paganism. It's not saying God the Father has his own spirit. There's a capital S there. It's talking about God is a spirit. When that Holy Spirit goes around, and I have the Holy Spirit in me, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Then you have God in you. Okay? Also, you have Jesus Christ in you through the Holy Spirit. 
God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Why would God say, beloved, believe not every spirit? Why did He say, beloved, believe not every body? Because that can be deceptive. We talked about it. How someone dresses on the outside can be deceptive. The Bible does talk about that, about be careful. Jesus Himself even said, be careful. I was worried they look like uh, white sepulchers, but inside they're full of dead man's bones. But inside they're full of dead man's bones, spiritually dead. Right? But God is a spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Turn to Revelation 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Seven spirits of God. Okay, this is a whole other teaching, but I want to put out, generally it's talking about the Holy Spirit. There's some great teachings how these seven spirits of God are basically the seven jobs of the Holy Spirit what the Holy Spirit is capable of doing and supposed to do. Uh, turn back to Isaiah, because this goes back to Isaiah 11.2. Turn back to Isaiah 11.2. And the Spirit of the Lord, that's one, Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit, shall rest upon him. That goes into what the Holy Spirit can do. The Spirit of Wisdom. What does the Bible say? The, Holy, uh, the Comforter will come and guide you into all truth. When we need wisdom, what do we do? We ask God for it. Okay. And understanding. The Spirit of Counsel and Might. The Spirit of Knowledge and of the Fear of the Lord. What's the Holy Spirit doing out in the world? It's convicting people of sin. And telling them they need to be fearing the Lord. Okay, the Holy Spirit's out there convicting the world. And the Holy Spirit's also in you, brother, says Christ. And when you start going down the wrong path, mistreating a brother in Christ, uh, the flesh, what is it, the world, start getting into the world and worldly things and betraying brethren so you can have the world, or betraying brethren so you can have the flesh, because we're going to get in here. One of the tests of someone that has an antichrist spirit is they don't love their brother in Christ. They don't love the brethren. It's all words. But you're to try the Spirit. Do they truly love the brothers and sisters in Christ? Not just in words, but in deed. And what's the heart behind it? But the world, the flesh, and Satan. Okay? The Holy Spirit convicts you. Convicts you. Convicts you. Okay, the Bible says resist the devil and he must flee. You've got to have the Holy Spirit in you to resist the devil. A lost person can try resisting the devil. Remember uh, that passage where they're trying to cast out demons? And they're like, Jesus I know, and Peter I know, but who are you? They're trying to cast out a devil, and they weren't saved. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. They can't resist the devil without the Holy Spirit. That's what this is all about. Um, Exodus 31. Exodus 31. Like I said, I don't understand everything when it comes to the seven spirits of God. There's some brethren out there with some amazing studies on the seven spirits of God. But ultimately, when I look into it, the more I look into it, I realize it's the Holy Spirit, period. Okay? How can the Holy Spirit be seven spirits and yet be one? I don't know. How can, uh, uh, I mean, you have the Godhead. God the Father is the soul. Jesus is the body. The Son of God is the body. And the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. There's distinction as if they're separate, but these three are one. There's just one God, capital G God, the Father. Great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay. Exodus 31. Thirty-one, three. it says, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge 
and in all matter of workmanship. The Holy Spirit comes in and tells us how to live and how to do things. Gives us the strength to do things. Gives us the knowledge, understanding, wisdom, all these things. But ultimately, God is a spirit. Four spirits in the Bible, ultimately, when you break it down. God is a spirit, the Holy Spirit. What about man? We read up there already that man is, has a spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.11. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2.11. Let's start at verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, the Spirit of God. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, seeking God. A lot of false converts, they're not seeking God, they're seeking the world. They're not seeking God, they're seeking the flesh, to please the flesh. Brothers and Christ, you too can fall into the trap where you're not seeking God, you're seeking the world, you're seeking the flesh. And you become part of the falling away. Like I said, this isn't fast food Christianity. You can't just look at someone and say, hey... He's fallen into the world. He's got to be the Antichrist spirit. He's got to be false. You've got to try the spirits. Was the man in a standing position to begin with? Yes. I mean, we're all in a fallen position to begin with. I'm talking about after salvation. God cleans up your life. You're in a standing position. You're fighting the world. You're fighting the flesh. You're fighting Satan. Then what happens? Over time, something happens and you start falling into the world and the ways of the world. The world comes first. I want, I want. Uh, Brother in Christ, uh, Brother Brad Abenshaw has a good study on, um, really convicting study on um, covetousness, which is idolatry. I want, I want, I want. I want, I want, I want. Satan says, I'll give you these things. I'll give you these things. If you fall, but fall down and worship me instead of the God that you were worshiping. Talking about brethren that fall away. Okay. You have to try the spirits and say, okay, was this person truly saved and he fell away? Or was this person lost to begin with? You've actually got to talk to him. You've got to listen to his testimony. See what kind of life he's been living prior to the state that you see him in right now. It takes time. It takes prayer. It takes God showing you the truth, studying the Word of God. It takes having the Holy Spirit in you. But it takes time. There's no such thing as fast food Christianity, but some of the brethren are falling for the fast food Christianity. So if they say, is, if he says, has come in the flesh with the body, he's automatically lost. But did it say, try the body? Or did the Bible say, try the spirits? It said, try the spirits. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Remember what the Bible says? For the Holy Spirit, that he hear, what he hears, that shall he speak. God the Father speaks through the Holy Spirit to us. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? The spirit knows the soul. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the teachings, let's keep going though, the safe spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. You want to know God better? You want to know things better? You need to get saved. You need to have the Holy Spirit in you and God will open this book to you. But going back to this, spirit knows what's in this man. Say the spirit of man knows what the soul is all about. We can't see the soul. We can't see the spirit. We can only see the body. But the heart will come out through the body eventually. Someone's true self will come out whether they're truly saved. It takes time and patience. One of the things is, it's hard with me is patience. You've got to be patient. You've got to be patient with the Lord. The Lord's patient with you. Be patient with the Lord. He'll help you in His time. He'll answer prayers in His times. He'll reveal things in His time. But brothers and sisters Christ, we've got to be patient and start looking at everything, but mainly the Spirit. But there are some great teachings about uh, the great white throne for the lost world, where you have the soul sitting there. 
And he's like, here's all these things, here's all the accusations against you, all your sins and everything. Everything's going to be read out. And then the soul's going to be like, I, I didn't do those things. And then God's going to be like, but we have a witness. Oh yeah, what's the witness? And here you come up walking. The same person as this soul comes up walking. It's the spirit. And he stands there and goes, yep, I did those things. Yep. I did that. Yep, I did that too. Yep, those people came by and preached truth to me and I ignored them. I kicked them to the side like they were nothing. Yep, I did that. What does it read right there? For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man? That's going to be the witness against those people at the great white throne. Okay. But the spirit of man, man has a spirit. Genesis 2.7 All the way back to Genesis 2 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, there's the body, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, there's the spirit, and man became a living soul, there's the soul. God gave us a spirit, God gave man the spirit. Okay. All things come from the Lord when it comes to. When you start looking at the basics, all things come from the Lord. We didn't get the spirit of our own. We didn't get this body of our own. We didn't get our soul of our own. We didn't get the spirit. It was all given to us by God. God is our lifeline, the spirit of man. He can pull that lifeline in a heartbeat and kill us. Send us to hell. Or if you're saved, bring us home. Let's say you're getting really messed up as a Christian and you're just being a bad example and you're ignoring the chastening of the Lord, the chastening of the Lord. God can pull the plug and bring you home early. And you'll miss out on rewards. And you have to answer for that life at the judgment seat of Christ. All right? But we have God as a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Man has a spirit. What about beasts? Turn to Ecclesiastes 3.21. One of those ones where I don't turn to it that often, so I'm trying to find it. <laughs> That's Esther. And then there's Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 3.21 And who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast with go which goeth upward? downward to the earth. There's another passage that talks about how animals, they have a spirit and they have a body, but they don't have a soul. Animals were not made in the, in the likeness of God. I don't want to go into that too much, but there's still brethren out there that keep saying, we're all made in the image of God. That's, that's deception. They're making a mistake. They're PWCing what someone else said. Probably want a cracker. Only Adam was made in the image of God. Adam and Eve and the rest of us were made in the likeness of God. Beasts were not made in the likeness of God. Adam lost that image when he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He lost that image. We are now in the image of Adam. This body of flesh, this wicked flesh that deteriorates, that falls apart, that's wickedness, that's tempting us to do wickedness and sin, comes from the fall of Adam. We are in the image of Adam. But beasts were not made in the likeness of, of God. Beasts do not have a body, soul, and spirit. They just have a body and a spirit. No soul. Okay? I brought up Daniel, but what's so big about the spirit, spirit of the beast? I mean, when we're reading in John, 1 John chapter 4, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, plural, whether they are of God. What about this spirit here? Can a man... Start acting like a beast. Daniel 4.25. A lot of you who know Daniel know where I'm going with this. Daniel 4.25. Oops. That good. Daniel 4.25. That they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. God's in charge of everything. This is Nebuchadnezzar. Gets, 
so gets, gets prideful and say, I'm basically, he tries to act like he's the Most High. Look at me, look how great I am. I'm greater than the Most High God. And God has to put him in his place. And one of the ways he puts him in his place, he starts acting like a beast. Now, I'm not saying that mankind can have the spirit of an animal, but I thought that was very interesting that you can look at men today, remember that saying that you're acting like an animal. Stop acting like an animal. The way, when I was a little kid, when I wouldn't use the utensils and I just grab from the plate of food, just grab it, just shovel it in, shovel it in. You know that saying, you're eating like an animal. Stop that. You're acting like an animal. Stop that. Okay? But mainly it's talking about our flesh. Not that we have the spirit of a beast, but it's talking about our flesh. But I found that very interesting. But you see that beasts have a spirit. And it's funny... Not funny, but it's interesting, sorry, I used the wrong word. If it's, it's interesting that what is the Antichrist called in, the, in uh, the time of Jacob's trouble? The beast. There's going to be a mark that comes around that they're trying to try to get on the body called the mark of the beast. Hmm? Very interesting. But back to this study. Okay. What about evil spirits? The Antichrist spirit is the ultimate evil spirit. And I believe that it basically sums up all the evil spirits that we have today. Why? Because when we get to the end of this, all the evil spirits today are preparing the lost world, this world, trying to push the time of Jacob's trouble. And you know what's holding off that time of Jacob's trouble? He who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Us. And one of the bad things, and I'm, we'll get to this here in a second, but one of the bad things I'm seeing out there is we're, we got brethren in ministry that are trying to motivate you to run to the wilderness and hide. Off-grid living, off-grid living, and go hide, hide, hide. You know what's holding the Antichrist, from, or the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, from showing up? Us standing out there and being a light for Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Wherever you're living, it, whether it's in a city, Big city, small city, whether you're living out in the countryside, whether you're living in the wilderness, it doesn't matter where you're living, God has you there for a reason, to be a light to the world. To hold off this evil, wicked system until God says enough is enough, come home, and then this evil, wicked system we're going to be talking about real quick, it's going to thrive 50 times more than it already is today. Called the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not supposed to be running and hiding. The Bible doesn't teach we're supposed to endure to the end to be caught up. Because I always have to correct myself. People say, I'm joking around, their brothers say, we have to endure to the end to be saved. Oh, wait a minute. That'll show that I'm really a heretic. Uh, we got to endure to the end to be caught up. I don't have to endure to the end of anything. If God chooses to kill me right now, right here, this city gets exploded by war, by whatever, and I get killed, Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'm going to continue doing the work of the Lord right here. If God calls me somewhere else, it better be to be doing the work of the Lord. Brothers and Christ, I always look at selling this house, selling this place and movement. The only reason I would move is to be part of a house church, a meeting house, a body of Christ, a ministry somewhere. I'm not moving just to move. Oh, you need to leave that city and, and go live in the wilderness. Why? Because it's safe. No, it ain't. God can easily kill you there as He can in that city. Are you trying to doubt God and His power and His might and His wisdom? Uh, no. The only justification that you should move from where you are, brothers and sisters in Christ, is to serve God better wherever you're going. And to be a servant to the Lord and to be a light unto the world. Didn't mean to go off a little bit on that tangent. But this right here is what we're holding back. And if all the brethren leave the cities, leave the areas where the light needs to shine, and run to the wilderness, hiding in caves, I mean, just the whole attitude sounds like the time of Jacob's trouble, what the Jews are going to do. We're being told today to act like the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, no, we're supposed to be a light to the world. We're supposed to stand, 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 stand. Don't faint, don't falter. Don't let this stuff cause you to crumble and fall away. Evil spirit, Satan, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. 
We did it over here, but I wanted to read 12. Okay? For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Spirit of man, spirit of God. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. There's some brethren out there that are starting to act like the world and take things in the world more important than the things of God. Now we have not now we have received not the spirit of the world, that Antichrist spirit, but the spirit which is of God, the Holy Spirit, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Notice what it said, that man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We compare spiritual things with spiritual. I'm sorry, spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual things with spiritual. Is man, is man gets flesh getting in the way? Or is that man of the world? That's what we're judging. Beloved believe, believe, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they have God. Is man's flesh getting in the way? Are they struggling? Or are they of the world? There's a spirit of the world? Yeah, it's that Antichrist spirit. Uh, Revelation 16, 13. We're not going to go through every spirit out there because there's a lying spirit. Okay, there's this... Uh, deceptive spirit. There's all these evil spirits out there. But we're going to hit some that's talking about the Antichrist spirit. Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the frost, the false prophet. Now I've got down here, like I said, we'll be talking about that at the very end. What's all this whole thing about why is God telling us to discern between these spirits and this spirit, the Holy Spirit? Because these spirits are preparing the world for the time of Jacob's trouble, for the Antichrist. That's why it's called an antichrist spirit. It's preparing people for the mark of the beast, the uh, false prophet that comes in and prepares them for the beast, and the mark of the beast in the one world order. That's what this is all about. Okay, That's why we're supposed to be judging these things. Are they of God? No. Preach the gospel to them. If they've got bad spirits in them, you know how you get cast spirits out today? You lead them to Christ. You lead them to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit come in, it will chase out those evil spirits like that. That's how you cast out spirits today. You, you preach truth to them. When you realize that person isn't truly saved, let's say they're a press, professing Christian, and they're not truly saved, what do you do? You preach truth to them. You go always go back to the gospel. I even say this with someone who is saved. Let's say you have someone who is saved. God, the Spirit, has the Holy Spirit in them. They are saved. They start falling back into the world. They start falling back in the flesh. What do you do? Do you say they're lost? They have an Antichrist spirit. They're lost. No. What do you do? You go back to salvation because this is getting in the way. Sometimes this can get in the way. The wisdom of men can sometimes get in the way and struggle with the wisdom of God. With a saved sinner... This gets in the way. They get really messed up. What's the solution? The solution is the same whether you're saved or you're lost. A false convert or truly saved. The solution's simple. You go back to salvation. And you remind them. If they're truly saved, you remind them why they got saved. Brother says Christ, I preach the gospel to professing Christians and they show nothing but hate and disdain for the gospel and for me and yet they're professing Christians. Oh Yeah. Beloved, believe not every spirit. I never said they were lost. Just because I always tell people, just because I link the gospel message, there's times I'll link the gospel message and say time's running out for anybody to see the gospel message under whatever video. I did it under a lot of videos. But when I just link the gospel message to somebody without saying time is running out, it's to remind them why they got saved. Who saved them? And that they're not supposed to be like the world. 
The flesh isn't supposed to be in charge. God's supposed to be in charge. And you're not being much of a light for the world. But bottom line, you have evil spirits, unclean, I'm sorry, unclean spirits. Revelation uh, 2, chapter 2, verse 20, there's another big spirit that's here at the end of days that's really destroying everything. An evil spirit. It destroys families. And that, I mean, look at uh, America. Families are destroyed for the most part. It destroys families. It destroys countries. That's why you have the mother of harlots. Mystery Babylon is referred to as a mother of harlots. A woman sitting on seven, I think seven hills or so many hills. Revelation 2.20 Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess. Remember, we're trying to find out if they're false prophets. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. One of the biggest examples of that is the Trinity. Catholicism comes in, the Catholic Church, with the, Je we call it the Jezebel spirit. Feminism, but the Jezebel spirit comes in and says, hey, and starts seducing servants to commit fornication. And they bring in the Trinity. Oh, it's the same thing as the Godhead. No, it is not. Not even close. The more I study it, the more I realize that's fornication. That's idolatry. It's paganism. It has no basis in Scripture, the Trinity. Godhead teaches that it's God in the person singular, person singular of Jesus Christ. And people are still fighting me to this day. I quote scripture to them and they get angry. <laughs> That's like I said, it's a test. I don't say they're lost. I quote scripture to them. They get angry. They get more angry. They get more angry. And a lot of the times the arguments for standing for the Trinity are all based off feelings and opinions. They try to use worldly arguments. They try to use wisdom of men. Men's wisdom. They're not using God's wisdom. Okay. But you have that Jezebel spirit that, that I believe is linked to the Antichrist spirit. Big time. I mean, you want to destroy everybody? Who did, who did Satan go after in the garden? And I know some of the feminists out there, they get all upset. Oh, you just talk. Who did Satan go after in the garden? Eve. When she didn't have her head covering with her. What tempts the angels? A woman with no head covering. What has destroyed America? Feminism. What, all these movements from America went out into the world. All these countries. We've got to liberate all these women and everything. What destroyed those countries? Feminism. Destroyed those countries. Right. That's a big spirit. You know what the number one thing? Here's, you want to know what the number one thing? I talk to sisters in Christ. I believe we're saved. I love my sisters in Christ. This isn't me attacking you, but I've had sisters in Christ that have great testimonies that will talk to me about how they struggle. The number one thing they struggle with is the Jezebel spirit. Feminism. It's the number one thing they struggle with. It's trying to destroy their families. And it has. I've seen women destroy their families because of the Jezebel spirit. Okay, I've seen men destroy their families for other reasons, but we're talking about the Jezebel spirit right now. I've seen women do it. You're not my head covering. I don't have to do what you say. You don't tell me what to do. I can dress however I want, act however I want. you got daughters that act the same way. Okay, you got the prodigal son that wants to go out in the world, like I said, but we're not talking about, we're talking about the Jezebel spirit. And the seduction there, the men are at fault because the men are allowing it to happen. Okay, and these last days, it's like it's already, it's already such a growth, there's no way to stop it. But you're still to stand against it as much as possible. But notice it talks about seduction. Seducing. Okay. So you've got evil spirits. But ultimately, the Bible sums all these evil spirits, the lying spirits. So you, the Bible talks about pride, the spirit of pride. Well, who's the king of pride, of the children of pride? Satan. Satan down here, we'll talk about Satan. Who's the spirit of pride? Satan. Who's the father of lies? Satan. Who's the great deceiver? Satan. 
All these evil spirits the Bible talks about, it all goes back to Satan. Hmm. That antichrist spirit. Go back to 1 John chapter 4, we're in verse 4. So my, I mean, to sum it up, the body says something, you don't just judge on the spot. You take time to try the spirits. I'll give you an example real quick. It says, first, first 4 it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Man's spirit, the beast spirit, all the evil spirits. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Predominantly, the Antichrist spirit. And sometimes we start quenching the Holy Spirit and we start listening to this Antichrist spirit that, want, that promotes the world and the way of the world. Worldliness that promotes the flesh. Satan, like I said, the three things Satan's really not notorious for. Lies, deception, and pride. He wants lies, deception, and pride in your life. You can quench the spirit. We're to try the spirits. A good example is, is a brother in Christ, I believe he's saved. He's spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rooms of the world. It just seems like a lot of us are dropping like flies when it comes to that one, and you know who you are out there. Dropping like flies when it comes to the world, traditions of the world, and being spoiled by it. Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I. Traditions of men. I'm doing things the way the world wants me to do things. They're not doing things the way God wants them to do things. And who I'm talking about today is David Daniels. I love my brother in Christ, and I need to learn how to love better, which we're going to get into. I need to learn to love my brothers and sisters in Christ better. But one of the things is, is they caught him in a video where he read, is come in the flesh, but then when he talked, he said, has come in the flesh, verbally. People say, well, he failed the Antichrist challenge, therefore, he's over here, he's lost, he's a fake, he's a fraud. Uh, did you try the spirits? Oh, no, I don't have to try the spirits. He said it. The body said it. Therefore, he failed the Antichrist challenge. Well, if you actually took time to research and talk to the man but listen to his life, David Daniels is a man who has studied, he started out with an NIV. He was just lied and deceived, I think it was the NIV, he was lied and deceived and he used the NIV most of his life. Then when he got saved and born again and brought to the true plan of salvation and the, and the, perf, and the Bible version issued, King James Bible, he started being an advocate for the King James Bible. So he quotes a lot of Bible perversions and lines them up with the King James Bible and shows where the King James Bible's right, the Bible perversions are wrong. So when he stands up there and he's got to preach, and he's going off, you know, there's a lot of times he stands up and preaches the Bible version issue. So he's going over both versions all the time. So if he stands up there and he reads the right reading, and then slips up and says, "Is uh, has come in the flesh, could it be that this, the wisdom of man's getting in the way, the body's getting in the way, the wisdom of man, you just brain getting all, rat, all mixed up. That's why I think sometimes it's okay to go to study the Bible perversions to a point, but some of these men that really study the Bible perversions, that believe the King James Bibles, those Bible perversions have an antichrist spirit in them. If you study them too, you shouldn't have to study them that much. You should have a set thing where, okay, here's all the truth. It's so simple. This is the, the Word of God. Those are fakes. You don't have to keep studying them and studying them and studying them. It's going to start messing you up. Okay. But the thing is, is you talk to the man. Hey, I heard you say this. And you start fellowshipping and treating him like a brother in Christ and loving him like a brother in Christ until God shows you otherwise. And you sit there and you talk with him and you say, you keep slipped up and kept saying has come. He might have been like, you know what, you're right. I did slip up and say has come. It's is come. That's the Bible translation is is come. Okay. Uh, Peter Ruckman, I watched one of his studies where he was talking. He said, some guy came to him and said, you said such and such. And Peter Ruckman's like, I never said anything. I wouldn't say anything like that. Why would I say something like that? And he pulled out a recording of Peter Ruckman like 10 years previous. He said it. And Peter Ruckman's like, he's right. I did say that. Sometimes you can mess up and say the wrong things. 
Your body can mess up and say the wrong things. You can, your, your own intellect tries to get in the way of God's wisdom, and you can say the wrong things. Sometimes you can get overzealous for the Lord, like Peter did plenty of times, hacking the, the ear off. Overly zealous for the Lord, and you try to think, I'm on to something, but you're really not. I don't know how many times I've done Bible studies, and I'm like, I'm on to something amazing that I can show the brethren. This is something new, new, new. I think that's the biggest problem. Instead of sticking with the old, we always have to have something new, new, new. I've got this new thing I could show them. And then God brings me at the very, he lets me go crazy. And I'm going through this study, doing all these verses. He's like, this is amazing. It's fitting. It's amazing. And then at the very end, God brings me to two to three verses that totally destroy what I was about to teach. And I'm just sitting there going, it doesn't work. What I was thinking doesn't work. I was so excited. I thought I was on to something. I had the zeal of the Lord. But it doesn't work. Well, let's start all over. What else do you want me to, to, to teach, Lord? What else do you want, want me to, to study and read? It happens. This gets in the way. This, the spirit of man, gets in the way. This, the world, can really mess up with someone who's preaching and teaching. I've seen it, and you know who you are. The world messes you up. The flesh messes up someone who preaches and teaches. Okay? Pride. When you go over to Satan's way, pride can really mess up somebody. But you have to, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. And it's going to take your time. You've got to be patient. And you've got to keep watching. And you've got to be patient. Okay? People are so quick to jump the gun. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of false converts out there that have anti, uh, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing that have an antichrist spirit. Big time antichrist spirit. Okay. Go back to 1 John 3, 4. Now, the test, when it says try the spirits, it talks about the spirit that confesseth. Yes. But when it's talking about trying the spirits, I believe it's not talking about 2 and 3. It goes in and tells you this is how you try the spirits. Verse 4 says, Ye are God, little children, and, and, and have overcome them. Them. Because greater is He, the Holy Spirit, that's in you, than He, Satan, that is in the world. Let's keep reading. Here's where the testing starts. Blood, blood, how do you try the spirits? This is what people don't talk about. This is how you try the spirits. What I've been trying to push with you, brothers and sisters of Christ. Verse 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. I got into it with the brother in Christ about holidays, specifically Christmas, and you know what? I had a person defending that man, hardcore, that didn't even believe in the same gospel that man preached. He was a lot that was a lost person. Defending a man because he was promoting worldliness. And the world heareth them. That's what you got to be careful about, brothers and Christ. When you start becoming worldly, the world's going to start hearing you. Remember Pontius Pilate and Herod became friends that day over what? Jesus Christ. They were worldly. They had that in common. Okay, But it says here, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. It's two parts, brother. There's times we can slip up and sp as a saved sinner, we can slip up and speak like the world. And God will correct us, chasten us. We'll get correction through brothers and sisters in Christ. But this has two parts. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. That man, he's with the world, and the world loves him. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Do you have something in your life that's highly esteemed among men that you're cherishing over God, His Word, and the brethren, the ministry, if God's called you into ministry, full-time ministry, part-time ministry? We're all called in the ministry of reconciliation. But do you have something in that world that's just highly esteemed among men? It's an abomination in the sight of God. This is, the, this is one of the enemies. The flesh, the world, and Satan are the three enemies that you're going to be fighting until the day you die, brothers and Christ. It says there, one of the tests are, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Turn to 1 John 2.15. 
Oops, 1st John. Not John. 1st John. We were just there. 1st John. 2.15. says, Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now people always try to say, well, you can't, it doesn't mean you can't love a good pizza and stuff like that. Bottom line, what it's saying is, is I've always said this, God comes first and His Word comes first. They go hand in hand if you're saved. God and His Word comes first. If He's called you into ministry, that comes third. Or second, I'm sorry, second. Uh, and then the body of Christ comes third. Being a servant to God comes first. Being a servant to the brethren comes second. Everything else comes last. There's priorities. So when this is saying, love not the world, neither the things in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You hit somebody up and you say, hey, those video games, I've had to, I've never seen, if I've seen a brother in a standing position, they gave up video games, and they fall back into video games, I'm not going to say they got an antichrist spirit in them and they're lost and everything, no. I'm going to say that that brother is struggling with, with sin, and I go and correct him again with love, with the intent to build that brother back up. See, I'll go over that again real quick. When you go to correct a brother in Christ, brother says Christ, or you're being corrected, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. That spirit that comes to correct you is their intent to build you back up, to get you back to a standing position so they can gain their brother back? Or is their whole point to tear you down, like make videos against you, tell everybody to stay away from you, that guy will mess you up, all kinds of stuff tear you down to destroy you. Where's that spirit coming from? When you, when you go to correct somebody, you do it with love and with the intent to build them back up and get them back on the right path. That's this spirit. That's how you know we got this spirit in you. How do you know this? I got so many professing Christians that come to correct me and tear me down to destroy me and they've got this spirit in them. You have some brethren that are quenching the spirit over here, and they're looking like this over here. There's brethren I believe are saved. They quench the Holy Spirit, and they start acting like the world, and looking like the world, and doing things the world's way. It's almost like they're, they're giving in to that Satan, and, and starting to look like the Antichrist spirit, not the Holy Spirit. But you have to rightly divide the truth, and you've got to try the spirits. It's not something that's easy. You can't just jump into it in two seconds. Okay, that's Antichrist. It's not always that easy. Sometimes it might be, but for the most part, it's not that easy. Okay, it takes patience. It takes study. It takes prayer. It takes God opening your eyes. It takes talking to the person. I have some people around here that profess to be saved, and I've talked with them, and I've talked with them, and I've talked with them, and after being here for five years, I can say I don't believe they're truly saved. I don't believe they're born again. Well, I try to tell them about the Bible version issue. Okay? I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to the Bible version issue. But 1 John 2.15 is love not the world. James 4.4, 4, he adulterers and adulteresses. You know you not that um, friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Hello? The world's way is always going to be contrary to God's way. The Bible talks about being spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men. The world's way. After the rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. Some brethren are getting infatuated with culture and heritage and it's destroying them. And they're starting to look like this over here. But you have to discern whether they were ever in a standing point to begin with by trying the spirits and they're part of the falling away or were they always over here to begin with? you got to try the spirits. There's a big falling away going on right now, brothers and sisters of Christ. This isn't a two second, oh, I can, just, it's going to be so easy. Brothers, it's not. And it's not painless. It is painful because you got a brother in Christ that wasn't in a standing position. They're starting to look like this garbage over here. The world, the flesh, evil, uh, antichrist spirit, worldliness. You've got to cut ties. Cut fellowship. 
If they will not repent and get back to their first love, which is Jesus Christ and His Word, you have to cut fellowship with them. It's painful. It's hard. But people want the easy way out. You still love them as a brother in Christ, but they want the easy way out, which I'm going to get to here shortly. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Let's just treat them like they're always lost. That way we don't have to love a brother in Christ. That's what I'm noticing lately in the world today. But get back to the world. Love not the world. A friend of the world is the enemy of God. Romans 12.2 Romans 12.2 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. What happens if you start being as a saved sinner? What happens if you start conforming to the world? You won't be able to prove is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And there's brethren that are making a mess of their ministry because they're going to the way of the world. There's some false converts that I came across. Video games. Okay? If you're playing a video game, I'm not going to say you're lost. But when I come to you with the Bible and show you and give you my testimony about how video games destroyed my life hurt my eyes, but destroyed my life in many ways. Socially, uh, being able to talk to people, I was hiding from the world, because some people have alcohol that they hide from the world in, and some people have their video games. I had video games. I was never really hardcore into drinking, but I was in the video games. That's where I hid from the world, hiding from all my problems right here. This number one problem right here, I would hide from it in video games. Video games are designed to be addictive. They pull, if you're truly saved and born again, they're going to pull you away from the Lord and what matters. Doing things with your hands that please God. Video games don't please God. We go through all the verses. I have videos, but you talk to them. You sit down with love, brotherly love, and you sit down and talk to that brother or sister in Christ that's addicted to video games, maybe they're newly saved, and you talk to them about it. Then you find out when they start getting mad at you and start yelling at you, calling you names, same thing with holidays. Uh, brother, you sit down with love. This isn't in scripture. Holidays, holidays. And, and actually there's paganism behind these holidays. It's all about feeding your flesh. Ye can be as gods knowing good and evil. Satan, what does he promise God? Uh, promise say, uh, God, Jesus Christ. You can have the world if you fall down and worship me. What are these holidays mainly about? Self-worship. Me, myself, and I, the flesh, and ultimately Satan's behind them. I tell this to a brother in Christ, a lot of brothers, but a specific brother in Christ, and what he comes back with? Calling me names. That's how he comes back. You're a liberalist. You're a liberal liberty thief. You're a um, Pharisee. Now, I believe that brother to be saved, but he's gotten so spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of the world, after, after the traditions of men, I'm sorry, after the rudiments of the world, he's gotten so messed up here, and instead of coming back with love, and say, okay, let's do a Bible study, because I put my hand out there to do a Bible study, instead of coming back and saying, okay, let's do a Bible study, he decides he's just going to attack me and act like these people over here. The world, lost people, he's going to react and act like lost world. Which gets us to the next part. Well, first question. First John 2 16. First John 2 16. No, we did 2 15. What about 2 16? It says, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 16, though. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, The lust of the eyes, which is here for the flesh. And then here's one. And the pride of life. Who's the king of all the children of pride? Satan. Is not of the Father, but of the world. How do you do the Antichrist ch challenge? Are they worldly from day one and they haven't changed? I said a little prayer, and I, I'm part of this club now because I had this head belief, and I said a little prayer, and I'm part of this club right now. If there was a changed life where God called them out of the world, He saved them and pulled them out of the world, and they fall back, 
That's called the falling away. That's still a brother in Christ that's backslidden and fallen away. If you have someone who's a fake and fraud from the very beginning, Paul calls them false converts. False converts. Fakes. Frauds. Okay? That's what you're discerning with this Antichrist spirit. Are they of the world or are they of God? If they're of God and they've fallen away, then you can correct them with love to get them back to their standing point. If they were always of the world and they're a false convert, you preach the gospel so he can become a true convert and become a brother or sister in Christ. That's how we react. We don't react with hate and disdain and reward evil with evil. Our heartfelt desire is that those that are of the world get saved. And those that are saved that have fallen away, that we can pick them back up, that or God will pick them back up, but we can point them to Jesus Christ as the solution to all their problems and get them to get back up into a standing position. Mm -hmm. But one of the tests for an Antichrist spirit is not whether they verbally say is come in the flesh or isn't come in the flesh. Because notice in number three it says, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Okay? The spirit, not the body, not the soul, the spirit. That's what you're trying to discern. We're trying to discern spirits. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirits, but try the spirits whether they are of God, which we're going to get to, which I think we already did. But verse 5 said, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. Go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. That's one of the tests. The world heareth them. They're popular among the world. The world loves them. You can have a brother in Christ that falls back into this over here, and some of the world might, some people might start to love him, but the world as a whole is not going to love him because there will still be some parts of him, hopefully, that's still standing for some truth. They might have turned their back on some truth, but they're standing for some truth, and the world as a whole hates all the truth that this book has to offer. Okay? But when it's talking about the world, it's talking about the whole world loves them. You have these uh, famous people that supposedly get saved, and the world still loves them. If they truly got saved and born again, and rejected their life to, of the past, turned their back on Hollywood, sports, whatever, the world would hate them. If they truly got saved and was living a life of Christ. Here's the second test. Verse 6. We are of God. Talk about saved sinners. We are of God, the Holy Spirit. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The Bible talks about they that are of God heareth God's words. Ye are not of God. You hear them not because you are not of God. It takes the Holy Spirit coming in and opening the scriptures to us. So once again, you got the one of the, the test for someone who's fake and fraud is the world. Here's the second test. When you go to that person with the word of God, how do they react? The ailer of God heareth us. Because we're hiding God's word in our heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Then he turns around and says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. When you're talking to somebody who's, when it comes to the Bible version issue, if you came and talked to me, I got saved through the Bible version issue. You say, well, that's not in the plan of salvation. No. But you know where the plan of salvation can be found? In God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Something I didn't have. Something I was never taught. That this book is perfect. It's God's perfect written word. There is a perfect written word today in English. Here it is. And here's why it is. And there's plenty of studies on that. Um, that the King James Bible is God's perfect word. And by coming to the realization, okay, there is a perfect Bible out there. This has got to be it. Now what? Then God was able to bring me to the true plan of salvation. Repentance towards God, which is taken out of all the Bible perversions. Repentance is taken out. Repentance towards God. 
For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. When you have people out there professing to be saved, and they attack people coming to the cross broken, and having sorrow in their heart for sinning against God, sorrow in their heart for the consequences of said sin, and even fear, that it's going to send you to hell, but sorrow... Eternal separation from your Creator and God and hell. When you have someone who attacks that, that's an Antichrist spirit. Why? Because the Bible says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. One of the things we're being told, Brother Christ, is we're part of the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be testifying for Jesus Christ verbally and with the life that you're living. And you can become a bad testimony with the life that you're living, when you start falling back into the world and letting the flesh be in charge. Okay? The flesh. Romans 7.18. Turn to Romans 7.18. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. The same one we had up there, but we're going to go up here. For we know that the law, verse 14, For we know that the law is, a spirit, is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I'm carnal. Sold under sin. I'm going to hell. The body's in charge, and the soul loves what the body's doing. They're connected. For that which I do, I allow not. For that what I would, that I do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that it is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And you can read all the way through. When you're lost, they don't know how to do good. The laws of God, when you're reading that, the laws of God are written on every man's heart. So there's times where you can have your conscience. The Bible talks about how your conscience can bear witness with the Holy Spirit. Or the conscience can bear witness with your spirit. Or with your soul. And say, hey, that ain't right. What you're doing there isn't right. But the body's in charge. I'm doing it anyway. The body's in charge. When you get saved and born again, the Holy Spirit comes in. And the Spirit's in charge. Remember Romans 8. Therefore, um, yeah, Romans 8, chapter 1 says, the next chapter says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, capital S Spirit, Spirit of God. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, and not just any sin, my sin. Not your sin. No, don't understand. I'm talking about when you're talking, it's not about your, somebody else's sin, or the world's sin as a whole. You talk, it's my sin. My sin. Condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. Evidence of, of someone who got saved is a changed life. God's righteousness comes down. Jesus becomes Lord of your life. He sanctifies your life through His Word. He cleans it up, and now you're a light for Him, and you're separate from this world. Remember what we read? Those things that are, I'm going to keep preaching it because some brethren can't seem to get it through their head. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You're supposed to be separate from this world. Um, that the righteous law may be filled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Mind the things of the flesh? Now we're getting into spiritual judgment. Those that are after the flesh, mind the things that are of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, do mind the things of the Spirit. They that are of God, heareth us. We are of God, and they that are of God, heareth us. The Bible talks about we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. We're all supposed to be on the same page. And when you get people that are just totally 100% off from this, you're not dealing with someone who's saved. 
But they that have the Spirit do the things of the Spirit. For the carnal mind, but for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Life and peace. Truly living for Jesus Christ according to His Word. Not traditions of men come in, the world comes in, tries to tell you this is what being a Christian is all about. And it's fake. And that's how you have a lot of false Christians out there. According to His Word, life. And you have true peace that comes in. Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know why it says it's your reasonable service? Because it's what happens. It's reasonable. It's understandable. God comes in, saves you because of your flesh and worldliness, and he takes you out of the world, and he put gets, he teaches you how to put the flesh down so you can live a life of Christ. There's a change. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, but hold all things have become new. There's a change. Okay, there's the new birth. You're given a new life. You're washed in his blood. You're bought with a price. Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And notice that if you keep going down. From Romans 12, 1, you get the uh, Romans 12, 2, over here where the world says, and be not conformed to this world. You mean when you get saved, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice? Part of putting your flesh down means you're going to be separate from the world. You're not going to conform to the world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, God's grace saved me. Not me. God's grace saved me. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, not more highly, with Satan's way, pride, ego. But you're supposed to think soberly. What does the Bible say for Satan? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil go around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How does he devour people? With pride, with lies and deception, by promising him this and this, the world and the flesh. Oh yeah. I, uh, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. The flesh. We're not to judge off the body's reactions, but when you read this, when it talks about the flesh, we see something's not right, so the first judgment starts here with our sight, but that's not the complete judgment. Okay, that's we see something's wrong. What do we do? We investigate. We come in closer and investigate. Talk to the people. Find out what's going on. Talk to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Find out what's going on. Don't take one man's word for it. Talk. Talk to the, If you have a problem with the brother in Christ, you go talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. If you hear rumors about brothers in Christ... You don't listen to rumors. You go talk to that man one-on-one. -on -one. You investigate. Romans 6, 1 through 8. Romans 6, 1 through 8. What shall we say then? Shall we sin, continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? They that are of God heareth us. Because we are of God. Here I'm telling you, the old man is dead and buried. The old man that was worldly, that was all about the flesh, that loved sin, that loved the world, that conformed to the world, that was a friend of the world, that man is dead and buried. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism and death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk. That's works. That's action. 
We should walk in newness of life. We no longer conform to the world. We no longer love the world. We're no longer a friend of the world. We no longer have that spirit of the world. We have the Holy Spirit in us. The flesh is not in charge anymore. God is in charge. And when we do give in to the flesh and choose to sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who's a propitiation for our sins. He's ready to forgive us. And He's faithful to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we get away from the flesh and God gets us back on the right path. Repent, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord. Deny. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus Christ, God, who is God. The old man is dead and buried. We must walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The Bible says, Be holy for I am as, as I am holy. I think. Be holy as I am holy. Or for I am holy. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. This way of thinking gets destroyed. We still have this body of flesh that we have to deal with every day. But this way of thinking where the flesh... You're carnally minded and walking after the flesh. That's been destroyed. Knowing this, the old man is crucified with him and the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. You see somebody that when we preach against sin and they hate people preaching against sin, you might be dealing with somebody over here. You need to go in for a closer look. Oftentimes you are. Sometimes you might be uh, correcting a brother in Christ that their first mechanism is to put up a self-defense mechanism, a shield. And it makes them look like this over here. But I've had brethren who put up a big defense and got upset because I called out their sin. But then a month or two later, they came back and said, You know what, brother? You're right. I was just frustrated because you caught me. Or, and I felt very convicted. And I, I started trying to defend this garbage right here. And I was stupid. I don't know why I did it, brother. But you were right. That's where the patience comes in. You don't quick to judge in a heartbeat. That's where the patience comes in. It takes a little bit for some people. God's got to smack you around a little bit to get you back on the right path sometimes. Don't be so quick to judge. Patience. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. I'm talking about eternally. We still have to wrestle with this body of flesh and we still have to answer for our life uh, that we live in Christ Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. But once again, we have an advocate with the Father. He's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He that is dead is free from sin. We can always repent, forsake, and get back to our walk with the Lord. The lost world can't do that. The lost world is not free from dead uh, and trespasses in sin. But we are. When we do fail the Lord, we're not going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. Verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. There's coming a day. Now I love that song. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On that happy golden shore, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. We believe that we shall, future tense, also live with Him. We're going to be with our Lord and Savior someday. That's a glorious hope. And there's some brethren that are turning their back on that hope. Piece by piece, they're giving it up. They're not looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now. They're looking at the world. Their eyes are on the world. Their eyes are on the flesh. Their eyes are on Jesus Christ. Be very careful. Okay? So the second test we see here is we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. When we're preaching truth to them, what's their attitude for the truth? Is their flesh getting in the way? Or are they 100% fleshly to begin with, carnally minded and walking after the flesh, false convert? 
Or is their flesh just getting in the way? They're saved. They're newly saved. We're supposed to have grace for people that are newly saved. God is uh, working on them. And we're going to get to that a little bit further. Sorry for this being so long, brothers of Christ, but it's important. Loving a brother in Christ is understanding that when they're struggling with this, we're supposed to have grace. We're not supposed to be okay with sin. We're not supposed to tolerate sin. Um, what was it? One of the new false teachings coming out that they're messing up liberty, trying to hide liberty, a uh, sin under liberty, and then they came out and said that those of us that call them out for their for hiding, call them out for their sin, and trying to hide sin under liberty, uh, they're coming out now and they're messing up what um, the Bible talks about. If I have not charity, I am nothing. Now they're messing up what charity is. Charity is no longer self-sacrifice. Charity means you look the other way. Charity means you just tolerate their sin. That's not what charity is. Charity is self-sacrifice. You put yourself out there to correct a brother in Christ, understanding that it could cost you your fellowship with them if they go, they go this route and they go crazy on you. You can risk, you risk losing a brother in Christ. Self-sacrifice. I don't want to. Today's uh, fellowship is very hard to find good fellowship, but you got to be willing to sacrifice, self-sacrifice. What I want, that fellowship, for what God wants. And God wants us to correct one another. Okay. But what's their attitude? What's their heart? What's the spirit that's behind them? Is the Holy Spirit behind them? Or is it an Antichrist spirit? A worldly spirit? That's what this test is for. So the first test is, they are of the world. Speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The other test is, we go in. We try to preach truth to them. They could just be backsliders, backsliding into these two things, the world and the flesh. Or they could have always been there to begin with. That's what the test is. We're supposed to go in and take a closer look with the scriptures and with the... Let's say this is, the, this is just glasses, but this is the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to take the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, and we're supposed to take a closer look. Beloved, be not every spirit. Verse 7, here's the third test. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. There's people that say, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, and it's all words. They do not follow and obey the commands of the person they profess to love. Why? Because their Jesus is foreign to Scripture. Mm -hmm. We're watching out for that. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. What did Jesus say? If a man love me, he will keep my words. The Holy Spirit, we just talk about the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Uh, he's elevated his word above his name. And Jesus said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. Test. Do they love the word of God, the King James Bible, or do they hate it? Are they following the word of God? Are they struggling? Or are they just never had this to begin with in their heart? They just have the world in their heart. They have the world in their heart. They have the flesh, it's just flesh driven. This isn't in their heart at all. They're playing games. They're playing Christian. That's something that you have to discern through the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. They're the glasses, the Holy Spirit. And you take a look. Lord, show me the truth. And you pray. Prayer. Power of prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Show me the truth. Is there something, something's not quite right with this? Lord, please show me the truth. And He will. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest, and this is what I was talking about, when it comes to a brother in Christ that falls back here, the reason we're still to love them as a brother in Christ is for this reason. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that He might live through Him. The Holy Spirit, I'm mean, sorry, God the Father, which is the soul, lives through the body, Jesus Christ. Oh yeah. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. God loved me, and God forgave me of my sins. 
when I see, and even as a saved sinner, when I was newly saved, I struggled hardcore with sin. I fought God on some sins. God had to smack me around a lot to get to me where I am today. And when you see a brother in Christ that's newly saved and he's struggling with these things, you need to have the same grace that God had towards you, towards them. By all means, go to him and help him. If I had someone that was physically there, I might not have fought God so much. Be a brother in Christ. Be a friend. Preach the truth to him. Encourage him. That's why the Bible says exhort the brothers in Christ. Encourage them to do what is right. Okay, I might not have had that much hard time if I had brethren physically there to be accountable to. That's why I keep pushing the house church. But brothers in Christ, we need to have grace. I made the same mistakes even as a Christian. I, I failed the Lord plenty of times in my life as a Christian. God forgave me, picked me back up, and put me back on the right path. He can do the same for you. And yes, there are, I don't want to go off on too much attention, but you're going to have brethren that are going to grab those mistakes, like the mistakes I've made. I've made some big ones. And they're going to keep driving that, that, that mistake in like a knife and just keep, oh, you did this, you did this. They don't care about repentance, forsaking, and getting back to the Lord because that's what I've done. That's what you've done, brother and sister Christ. But when you've made a mistake... Sometimes those mistakes are going to stick with you for a long time. The enemy's going to use those mistakes. Sometimes you're going to come across a brother in Christ that when you go to correct them on something, they'll turn around and grab a mistake that you did in the past to try to justify their mistake present tense. They'll hold on to a mistake that you made in the past, past tense. Be careful about that. We're not supposed to be like that. If, so, if a brother in Christ has repented, forsaken, and they're back to living the life of Christ, serving the Lord and loving the Lord, we forgive them and it's gone. We don't bring it up. Unless, to, unless he wants to bring it up as a testimony to warn other brethren. Or we can bring it up as a testimony to warn other brethren. But we're not holding that man or that brother or sister Christ accountable for past sins that are under the blood. They've went to God. They've asked for his forgiveness. God is faithful to forgive. That's present tense. That's for saved sinners as well as lost. He's faithful to forgive. You don't hold that against people. But remember, we're supposed to have grace. The same mistakes you're seeing brethren have today, the same mistakes the elder men in the church and women in the church, they've made those mistakes. They've been there. That's why it's important to listen to testimonies of the elders. Okay. Here it is love. Not that we loved God but that God loved, past tense, us at the cross and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Remember, propitiation means ready to forgive. People take that word and say, He's forgiven, present tense. No, it means He's ready to forgive. You want your sins forgiven, you go to the cross. In the life of a Christian, you start sinning in your life as a Christian, truly saved, born again, saint of God, sons of God, you can go back to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, forgive me. You can go back to the cross and say, Lord, forgive me. And he's ready to forgive. But he's always going to look at the heart. Are you saying it just to say it? Or you truly have sorrow in your heart for that sin that you've sinned against him? Or did you just get caught and you're just saying it to say, I'm sorry, Lord, in front of them to put on a show in front of the people? Okay. Right? Once again, it comes down to trying the spirits. Looking at the heart. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. This is the third test. Loving the brethren. Okay. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is made perfect in us. His love is made perfect in us. Hereby know we that we believe that... Hereby know we that we dwell in, in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. One of the evidences that you have the Holy Spirit and not an Antichrist spirit is do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Some of the brethren aren't showing much love lately. Oh, oh, he said something. Therefore, I'm going to judge him over here without trying the spirits. Oh, this brother wronged me. What does the Bible say about you're supposed to do when a brother wrongs you? You go to that brother and you try to make things right. Even if you were the one that was wronged, 
You humble yourself and you go to that brother and you try to make things right and gain fellowship, that fellowship back with your brother in Christ. But you have brethren nowadays that are like, no, nah, I ain't doing it. I ain't going to go try to make things right. No. Nah. You know what? I think I found a loophole. Oh yeah, I got this great loophole. I know how I don't have to go to my brother and make it right. What if I start treating him like he's lost? What if I try to find reasons and excuses to make him out to be lost? Therefore, I don't have to have love for him because it's only for the brethren. So if I make him out to be lost, then I found a loophole. You really think God's really going to fall for that junk? Do you think brethren who are truly saved and born again are going to fall? Well, some of them have. You're not supposed to fall for that junk. God's not going to. He says you're to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Period. And you better have tried that spirit hardcore before you say that brother or sister in Christ is lost. You better have tried that spirit hardcore. When there's a disagreement between a brother and sister in Christ, that's not trying the spirits. And you're automatically, oh, we're just going to treat him like he's lost. I see that going around. Brother and sister in Christ, you need to snuff that out quick. If they're a brother and sister in Christ, that's not a scapegoat. Well, I'll just treat them like they're lost, therefore I don't have to love my brother and sister in Christ. You really think God's going to be patting you on the back for that one at the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, no. Okay. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, the Holy Spirit. There you see God, the Father, dwelleth in us. What's it talking about? The Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And His love is perfected, perfected in us. It's not something that happens overnight. It's perfected in us. The changed life happens over time. God gets this out of your life, the way of thinking and looking like looking at the world and thinking like the world and acting like the world. He gets the flesh, teaches you how to put the flesh down. It takes time and that love is perfected and you're now a light to the world. That light starts out small when you get saved and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter as you, your relationship gets closer and closer to the Lord. It's perfected. Okay? His love is perfected in us. God loved me so much that He gave me a new life. He saved me from the old man. He saved me from hell. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us because He hath given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. To be the Savior of the world. But once again, He's the propitiation of our sins. If you want to be saved... You gotta go to the cross. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That's another test. It's like a minor one, but it goes back to the Word of God. But whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Notice it doesn't say God the Son. We're not supposed to confess that Jesus is God the Son. That's Satanism. You make it a lowercase g God. We've already done studies on this. When you to make Jesus out to be God the Son, notice the is definitive. It means it's the only one. So you make lowercase g God the Son. He's a separate God from God the Father. Now you have two gods. That's not what this says here. It says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son, the capital S, Son of God. Of shows connection. Jesus is the body. God the Father is the soul. We just read a verse where God the Father speaks through Jesus, lives through Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, verse 9 where it said, The only begotten Son in the world. Um, well, we talked about this. I lost track of thinking of another verse. The brother says Christ, the Son of God, of, shows connection. When you say God, the Son, it severs that connection and makes Jesus out to be a separate God from God the Father. And you're going to have people who fight this and fight this and fight. They can fight it all they want. Where does it say God, the Son in the Scriptures? It doesn't. It says the Son of God. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. You have people out there that say, I'm a Christian, but they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe Jesus is connected to the Father, God the Father and is God fully and completely. You're dealing with someone who's probably going to be over here. He might be newly saved and confused, got saved, but he's still confused by this in his life. 
And he needs brother and sister Christ and the Holy Spirit. And they need to get in the Word of God and study the Word of God. But you're dealing with someone who's been saved for like 20, 30 years and they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God? Oh, he's just Archangel Gabriel. Oh, he's just a created being. You're dealing with an Antichrist spirit. And we have known and believed the love of, that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Here it is, is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You know how you have boldness in the day of judgment? In your life as a Christian, did you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Even the ones that hurt you. Even the ones that stabbed you in the back. Did you love them? I still love my brothers and sisters in Christ that stabbed me in the back, bear false witness, try to make me out to be lost so they can, can continue in their sin. They don't have to listen to what I have to say so they can continue in their sin. How do you get bold? How do you bold in the day of judgment? We love God's Word. Do you love God's Word and hide it in your heart? Are you separate from the world? Are you presenting your body as a living sacrifice? And ultimately, are you loving God's Word? You're loving the brethren? And your love for the lost world is preaching truth to them? It says to love your enemies. You're to love them by preaching the gospel to them. I heard a brother in Christ say something that was so horrible. He said that if you want my love, you have to come to the cross to get my love. No, if you want God's love, you go to the cross to get God's love. You, brother, that said that are supposed to be loving the lost world by preaching the truth to them and preaching the gospel to them. Witnessing for Jesus Christ and being a life. Your, your life needs to be a testimony along with your words. and You're supposed to be a light to the lost world. You're still supposed to have love, but the right kind of love. Not the world fleshly junk that you see out there that's all flesh. Feelings and opinions. No, God's love is supposed to shine through us. You want to be bold on the day of judgment? That's how. Because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear when it comes to the world. We still are supposed to fear God, but it's talking about to the world. Okay? Love, uh, we're not given a spirit of fear, but of peace, love, and a sound mind. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Some brethren can be talked into fearing this world. You've got ministries that are just all about looking at the world, looking at the world, looking at the world, looking at the world, look what's going on in the world, look what's going on in the world, and it starts getting brethren to be fearful. That's not a good ministry. Your ministry should put, point people to Jesus Christ as the solution to all their problems. Your ministry should keep people's eyes on Jesus Christ, His eminent return by the life that you're living. Living for Jesus Christ every day. Prayer, promoting prayer left and right. Giving God thanks, giving God glory in all things. Trusting God no matter what's going on in this world. But when your ministry starts taking a U-turn and starts going about things of this world, off-grid living, news, what's going on in the world, the world, the world, the, I'm down here, sorry, the world, the world, the world, the world, it's taking your eyes off of this. Be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. We didn't love him and then he loved us. We showed hate and disdain and bitterness towards God, and yet He loved us, that He gave His past tense, that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, because He loved us first, we love Him. My love for God, I still, there's times, I've been saved for eight years, Brothers and Christ, I've heard testimonies of men that have been saved like 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that they still, there's times where they fall before the Lord as if it was the first time talking about when they were lost and said, Lord, I was lost and without hope in the world. I was without you, Lord, and without hope in the world, and I was just hating you. The way I was doing things was loving the world and loving the flesh, and I was just such a hater of you, Lord. But you loved me, and you forgave me, and you saved me. That's a good thing, brother, says Christ, to come back to the cross every once in a while and remind yourself who you were before you got saved, why you got saved, and who it was that saved you. You do good to do that every once in a while. There's some brethren out there that have forgotten They've gotten distracted by this and this. 
putting family first, putting the world first, dream life first. Verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. He is a liar. But like I said, they, try to, they think they found a loophole. Well, we'll just say they're not saved. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some false converts out there. And once you've tried the spirits hardcore, you don't just jump the gun. They're lost. They're automatically lost. They're automatically lost. You try the spirits hardcore and buy this Bible buy, and everything and all the bad fruit. And the wrong, he's lost. Yes, I understand. There's false converts out there. But you better be trying the spirits hardcore before you make that judgment. That's a false convert. They're so playing Christian. I've been, even in my own life, been quick to judge. I'll judge someone as false without going through this. Now, I might, God corrects me and says, you need to go through trying the spirits. So then I go through and try the spirits, and I end up being right. That's a false convert. But God wants us to do it His way, not the world's way. His way, trying the spirits to see whether they are of God. Do they have this spirit? They have this spirit. We're supposed to do things God's way, not... Uh, try to make a shortcut. Because when you do shortcuts, there's times that you're going to judge someone over here that's over here, and there's times you're going to judge someone over here that's over here because you took a shortcut. You decided to be lazy. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. That's the final test. You get through all those things, those are the tests, brother says Christ, when it comes to the Antichrist spirit. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. Not whether they say is come in the flesh, or has come in the flesh, or was come in the flesh. It's where their heart is. You try, you try the spirits to see where their heart is. Do they have this spirit over here, the Antichrist spirit, or do they have the Holy Spirit? You're to try the spirits. Okay. Satan, we, got, we left this out because I was going to talk about the three enemies real quick. But one of the enemies is Satan, 1 Peter 5.8. Turn to 1 Peter 5.8. What's the whole big point about doing the Antichrist challenge? 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I've said this before. These are your three enemies. These are the three enemies that try to prevent people from getting saved. Ultimately, Satan can't prevent anybody from getting saved. But he can try. He can try by alluring you to the world. I promise you the world, if you fall down and worship me, he'll give you the flesh. I'll give you all this. You can feed your flesh and, and live however you want to live. I even give you this false Christ, uh, religion that calls themselves Christians that say you can have the world and live however you want and you can be saved. You can have that insurance of heaven when you're going to wind up in hell and then in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity because you're following for this man right here, Satan. He's not a man. He's a fallen cherub. He's not a fallen angel. He transforms himself into an angel of light. Why? Because God... His Son, Jesus Christ, God manifests in the flesh. In the Old Testament, He's called the uh, angel of the Lord. What is Satan wanting to do? He's wanting to copy Jesus Christ, who is God. So he tries to transform himself into an angel of light. But he's a fallen cherub. You're falling for this lie right here. All this easy believism and no repentance. They take repentance out and they don't push the changed life after salvation. They don't encourage to change life after salvation. Right. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He devours people, saved and lost. Satan's messed up a lot of saved people. So, this right here will prevent you from getting saved, or try to prevent you from, try, try, but if you truly come to the Lord broken, seeking God, you will find him. The Bible talks about if you seek him, those that seek God will find him. If you're seeking truth, God will bring you to the truth if you truly want the truth. But these are the three things that try to get in your way. Now, as a saved sinner, these three things, once you've gotten saved, 
will mess you up as a Christian. And you make sure that that light doesn't shine so that other people don't get saved. Be very careful. Uh, Job 41, 34. Job 41. Towards the end of Job. Job 41, 34. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. That's where you get king of the children of pride. From Job 41, 34. Satan is the king of all the children of pride. If he can keep the lost world prideful, it's a wall that keeps him from coming to God. God's got to break that pride. And every, I believe everyone, at one point in your life, God has destroyed that pride. And you had a choice, a choice to choose him or go pick up the pieces of that pride and try to super glue that pride back together. And now you've got pride again. That's what we're dealing with. Okay, but he's the children of all the the children of pride. John eight forty four. I think that's the one about how he's a the father of liars, father of lies. John eight forty four. John chapter eight verse forty four. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and bold not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is of his own. The children of pride, the children that love lies over truth. We talk about one of the tests is what's their attitude towards truth. All right. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, and he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. People would rather believe this guy over here that's going to wind up in, in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. I keep saying guy, but Satan over the Holy Spirit. And as a saved sinner, you can get deceived by wolves in sheep's clothing. Servants of Satan. And no marvel for Satan's ministers are all transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. He is going to look at them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me and ye accursed into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devils of the angels. If they had any good works, they're reprobate. But most of their works are false and based off of the world and pleasing the flesh. Pleasing other people. So I kind of left that out. I meant to do all three at the same time. But brothers and sisters Christ, for this whole study, remember, we're to try the spirits. It's not as simple as someone saying, it is come in the flesh versus has come in the flesh, or was come in the flesh. The true test is you need to try the spirit. Where is that coming from? Is their body getting in the way, the flesh, and they're making mistakes? Are they becoming worldly? A truly saved, born-again, Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman that starts backpedaling into the world. Or were they always in the world to begin with? That's trying the spirits. To see if they have the Holy Spirit and they're quenching it, or if it's this spirit over here, the Antichrist spirit. All right. Now I said, what's the whole purpose? Why do I believe God's telling us this? Because what I've seen, especially since we believe we're in the last days, and I believe we're in the last days, what's going on over here with all this? All these different spirits. The worldliness, the flesh, what's going on in the world. Okay. Satan wants to take away that blessed hope and make you and make you useless when fighting the three enemies and the false prophets' main goals. And we'll talk about that in a second. But he wants you to turn your back on the blessed hope. When it comes to a saved sinner, what is this over here? The evil spirits, the world, the flesh, Satan, the three enemies, what do they try to do? They try to take you away from that blessed hope. You take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you put it on the world. You take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you put it on the flesh. And you're no longer looking for that coming. Our heart's desire is to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. We're looking for that blessed hope. Before we got saved, we had no hope. You're going to hell and you're going to burn for all eternity. You have no hope. But now we are sealed after, after we get saved. We are sealed into the day of redemption. We're bought with the price. God has promised to come back and get us one day.
the catching away of the body of Christ. We're looking every day for that blessed hope with the life that we're living being a light to the world. Satan wants to destroy that. Okay? That's why we're to, Satan's got uh, ministers of Satan, wolves in sheep's clothing out there that have these evil spirits that are promoting this stuff down here. Why? Because he's preparing the world for the time of Jacob's trouble. He's trying to push, Satan's trying to push the world, and God's like, I'm not ready yet. You can keep pushing all you want, even though he keeps preparing the world. I'm not ready yet. He who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. There's people that still need to get saved. We need to be out there preaching the gospel. True love for the lost world is preaching truth to them. The plan of salvation. Okay? But you have the false prophets' main goals. I didn't have space to write this up here. I wanted to. The main goals is, is you have the false prophet, the beast, and the red dragon. They're preparing the world for the false prophet, the beast, and the red dragon. Okay? The mark of the beast and the one world order. Now don't get me wrong, the Bible says God unites the nation. God's allowing this stuff to come to pass when He's ready for it. In His timing, God's bringing it about. But how's He bringing it about? By letting that Antichrist spirit run more ver fervently in these last days. Look how wicked the world is. You go back less than, a, I say, 120 years, and the world was not as bad as, I mean, it just looks like Sodom and Egypt today. And the Bible talks about the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be like Sodom and Egypt, and it already looks like Sodom and Egypt. Are we close? Oh, yes, we are. So what are we supposed to be doing? Um, biting our nails and selling our property and going off and living in off-grid properties and in the boonies and in the mountains and hiding in the caves? No, we're to continue doing the work of the Lord. We're to continue living for the Lord every day and being a light to the Lord to the very end. And like I said, I love to live to see the catch away of the body of Christ as alive. But bottom line, if God kills me before that and I have to die for Jesus Christ and His Word, then I will. Absent from the body, present from the Lord. We're not supposed to be running and hiding. We're, what does the Bible say what Jesus said about a candle? You don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. You put it on the nightstand so it lights up the whole room. You're supposed to be a light unto the world, brothers and sisters of Christ. You don't run and hide. You be a light to the world. Now, God might call you to move. My God might call you to make some changes as, as things are going on in the world. Absolutely. But remember, don't be doing it because you're fearful of what's going on in the world. Don't let the world dictate how you live for Jesus Christ. Remember, this is what dictated how you live for Jesus Christ. Continue in it and stay in it. That's my big push. So I'm sorry about how long this has been, brothers and sisters Christ, but remember, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. And you better have tried that spirit hardcore before you say someone's lost. I'm talking about someone who's, more than anything, it's someone who you call the brother in Christ, and then like a year down the road, I've seen this so many times, that, I called him a brother in Christ, and we fellowshiped, and we had fellowship for a year or two. You mean for a year or two you couldn't figure out that it was, he was false? Chances are he wasn't. What happened? What broke up the fellowship is he decided to choose the world and the flesh, and he fell away from God. But this right here, like I said, you better make sure you're trying the spirits, and you're not judging on the outward appearance. You're not judging 100% based off the flesh. Our body of flesh can get the better of us sometimes, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can put our foot in our mouth. We can do some stupid things. Sometimes we can allow pride to come in. Satan to come in with his pride, king of pride. We can let pride come in. And we, we fight true correction from brothers and sisters in Christ. But I, like I've always said, that correction needs to come from here. And it needs to come from here. What I mean by here, I mean with love. To build a brother back up, not to destroy him. There's a difference. And with men in ministry, and, I, and after I got in ministry, I started realizing there's a big difference. There's some people that will correct you on every little thing, and correct you, and correct you, and correct you, and correct you, because they're trying to destroy you. And then you have brethren that will correct you on not little things. If I slip up and said the wrong word, but you knew what word I meant, then you don't come up there and, oh, i got to write this in the middle. i got to show that he's made this mistake, and he's made that mistake. No, it's the big mistakes that you come and talk to me about. Not a, slip, not a slip of words, 
with my mouth, but sins down here. Hey, brother, I see you starting to fall into the flesh. You're doing things you gave up, and you're falling back into them. Hey, brother, I see you're going back to the way of the world. That brother in Christ that I had a hard time with, uh, that was a mentor, he even said in his own Bible that Jeremiah 10, he was, he had it down, that was the, uh, talking about idols, Christmas trees, and that he wasn't for Christmas. But what happened? Something happened in his life to get him to go back to the world and not stick with the Word of God. Same thing with video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows, drunkenness. Something, if you're truly saved and God got it out of your life, something happened, something dramatic in this world, or something worldly came along, or the flesh came along, and got you to choose to sin and backpedal, to fall back into the old man. And we're here, brothers and sisters of Christ, trying to preach truth to you out of love. Some of us are. Some, like I said, there's enemies out there that will hold your mistakes against you, and they don't care about your repentance. They don't care about you being built back up and standing and, and walking that good walk again. That's not their goal. Their goal is to keep you down and to just beat you. You know, you hear that saying, kicking you when you're down? I know you can't see my feet, but kicking you and beating you when you're down. Well, you get back up, you repent, you forsake. They're still trying to beat you to get you back down. And you're like, I ain't getting down. I gave that to the Lord. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art offense unto me. For thou savest the things that be of men, and not the things that be of God. Okay. I can't express it enough. This, J, uh, 1 John, when it's talking about 1 John chapter 4, the whole chapter, it's talking about trying the spirits, and then it talks to you about trying the spirits. They are the world, therefore they speak they are the world. They are of God, heareth, heareth us. Because we are of God. What's their attitude to absolute truth? What's their attitude towards correction? Based off the word of God. Okay? We speak truth. What's their attitude towards it? I mean, uh, when it, going back to the Trinity real quick. Capital T Trinity is not a title for God in the Bible. That's absolute truth. What's your attitude towards it? I don't care. Trinity is a lowercase t as a description of God is not in the scriptures. That is absolute truth. What's your attitude towards absolute truth? God in three persons is not in the scriptures. That's absolute truth. What's your attitude towards absolute truth? Person has to have a body, soul, and spirit to be called a person. What's your at That's what the Bible teaches. We did a word study in person. And so on, the true plan of salvation, repentance to salvation. Repentance comes before salvation. And, and the Bible describes repentance when it applies to salvation. It's not just a change of mind, but it's a change of heart. You go from loving sin, the flesh, to having sorrow for said sin. You go from loving sin to hating sin, and you have sorrow for sinning against God. I've come across people who admit that they're sinners. Yeah, I'm a sinner. So what? I love my sin. I love the life I'm living. I'm a sinner. Yeah, I know I'm probably going to wind up in hell someday, but I don't care. I love this life. What needs to happen to them? They need to become broken. This needs to get broken. The flesh. They need to come broken and have sorrow for that sin. So admitting that you're a sinner isn't salvation. doesn't lead to salvation. It's having sorrow for said sin. Oh, I don't care. That's in the Scriptures. And on and on and on, brothers of Christ, we preach truth to them. Dispensational teaching, eternal security, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, which includes looking for Jesus' coming every day with the life that you're living. You have brethren that have taken their eyes off the imminent return of Jesus Christ, so if their eyes aren't on Jesus Christ, the only other place their eyes can be on is this right here, the world. That's the two places your eyes can be on. They can be on Jesus Christ and His precious promises and living for Him every day, or it's going to be on the world. All right. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. So I hope this has helped you, brothers and Christ, to remember we need to love one another. And yes, if you have to kick a brother in Christ out of your fellowship, you're not kicking them out because it's hate. I hate them. You're kicking them out of your fellowship so God can deal with them and build them back up so they can be brought back back into the fellowship. That's your hope and goal. I had to part ways with the brother in Christ recently. My goal is I didn't kick him out with hate 
and disdain, and I'm not trying to make him out to be lost, and I'm not telling brethren, you need to stay away from him or he's going to mess you up. I kicked him out so God can deal with them, as the Bible says. They that are without, God judgeth. You give him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He wants this stuff down here anyway. When you have a brother in Christ that's got to be put out, it's because of this stuff down here is what they want. So fine, we'll put you without for the destruction of the flesh, that your soul may be saved. That you can be brought back in. God will break you, humble you, get you back on the right path, and then we can invite you back into the, into the fellowship. But we're not supposed to hate. That's what the lost world does. The lost world is full of anger and bitterness and hate. They reward evil with evil. They have no hope, and they're without God in the world. Why are we as brothers and sisters in Christ acting the same way as the lost world? These spirits that we're trying, acting like the world, doing things the way the world says to do them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you do well to get back into this book and get back to knowing this book like you should know it. Okay? You need to read this book from cover to cover. Primarily, you need to memorize and apply to your life the Pauline epistles, but instruction righteous is all through the Bible. You need to make sure you're reading this whole book. At least once to twice a year, you should make it through this whole book. At least once to twice a year. You might make it through the Pauline epistles, the New Testament, 50 times a year versus the Old Testament. But we still need to be reading this whole book. And you need to be knowing this book. Okay? That's how you grow closer to God. By knowing who God is. He reveals it to us through His Word. Okay. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, this is done out of love. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.